Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Inspire to Drive Conference presented by the Siebert Lutheran Foundation. My name is Charlotte John Gomez, and I have the distinct pleasure and honor of serving as president of the foundation. We've been through so much, haven't we, since we last gathered together in person in fall of 2019. And I just can't even tell you how excited we are to be with you today in this new virtual space so that we can refresh our minds and our spirits as we listen to learn with our hearts and to grow the kingdom. In 2020, Saver took an intentional pause with our annual conference, which ironically wasn't even related to the pandemic but we took a pause to engage in a research and discovery process to inform how our annual conference, formerly known as Change Your Eye, might be reimagined. Our research partner, Outside Network, conducted focus groups and interviews and online survey and closely analyzed all of your feedback and the information that we received. Some of the changes we may implement in the future because they pertain to an in-person event. But a key change that we made this year is what you'll notice is that we've introduced a concurrent session format where attendees can choose topics and speakers that are of interest to you and your own ministries. This allows us to offer more topics and for you to personalize your own conference experience to make it most meaningful for you and your ministry. Another significant change you probably noticed is that the name has changed. If you attended the conference in 2019, we asked you to submit a word that would represent what the conference has meant to you and your work over the past 10 years. Your responses have helped us to craft a new name that describes not only the content of the conference, but the event's intent. We pray that what you hear today will inspire you to learn more, to do new things, and to carry on your, to your fruitful path and make positive changes so that we all can thrive in our God-given roles and consequently maintain and grow thriving ministries. And speaking of thriving, one of the reasons Siebert's conference has been thriving for so long is through the generous support of our sponsors. This year, please join me in thanking Catalyst Construction and Carthage College for their generous support and sponsorship. I encourage you to take some time to go visit their virtual exhibits under the sponsor tab of the conference website and learn about their work supporting and growing the kingdom. We know that many of you attend Siebert's conference to connect through meaningful ways and conversations with your peers. And that all looks a little different in this virtual space, but it's still possible. So take advantage of the chat area of the conference website to join a discussion about a specific topic that interests you or start a new conversation with some of your peers about other topics on what you're learning today and tomorrow. Our desire is that these chat rooms are a way for you to interact intentionally with your peers and network with others. And so that this online format can serve as a proxy for those usual in-person interactions at the snack bar. Before we launch into our opening keynote presentation, I'd like to say thank you to a few people. First of all, I'd like to thank Siebert's Board of Directors for leading and championing the work of the Siebert Lutheran Foundation. This talented group of professionals guides and empowers us Siebert staff to fulfill Mr. Albert F. Siebert's legacy, which includes bringing you this thriving uh, Inspire to Thrive conference. And another big thank you goes out to our Pan Lutheran Conference Planning Committee. This group provides important insight into the trends and themes and speakers that create a safe environment and fellowship for all of us today. And I'd also like to extend our gratitude to Siebert's staff 
and especially to Michelle Burmeister, who has worked so hard to ensure that this virtual conference will meet all of our needs today and tomorrow. And finally, a big thank you to all of you for being here today. Your presence is a blessing and we pray that your conference days are filled with the light and love that only Jesus can provide. I wanna share a few notes before we start. Uh, you might be able, you are able to join sessions 10 to 15 minutes prior to their start time. All of the sessions will be recorded and you'll be sent a list of recordings a couple weeks after the conference. If the speakers provided a presentation or other reference materials, you'll be able to see that during the presentation or after their session on the session's landing page on the conference website. And here's a really important piece. Please use the Q&A box to submit questions for speakers. There's also a chat box on your screen and that should be used for commentary or chatting with other attendees. The questions will most likely be answered in the Q&A box. And so with that, and without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Reverend Dr. David Daubert and Pastor Carlos Lyer, who will talk about navigating the season of change and growing the hybrid church. Pastor Daubert is a second career pastor who has served in congregational, synodical, and church-wide ministry positions. Today, he leads Day 8 Strategies, which work with congregations, judicatories, and other organizations throughout the United States and Canada. He's a recognized leader in the fields of church renewal, leadership, strategy, and stewardship. Pastor Daubert is joined by Pastor Lair, who graduated Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in 2006 and spent the first 10 years of his ministry at Divine Savior Church and Academy a new mission start in Doral, Florida. During this time, he served in various roles before being called to be the president of Divine Savior Ministries. In 2017, he earned his MBA, and currently he oversees a multi-site church and academy with six campuses in Florida and Texas. And so now let me turn it over to both of you. And let's launch into our opening keynote presentation. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. There we go. Uh, thanks for having us. We're glad to be here. Um, I'm Dave Daubert, I'll go first. I'm here with Carlos, who I met as part of this process, and it was a, a great joy to get to meet him and hear about his ministry, and I know that you're going to enjoy meeting him and hearing about the ideas and thoughts he has as we move forward. I want to start with a, with a reminder where we started, and we started with Easter, um, and Easter of last year was a, quite an experience. It was uh, really um, shocking. And most of us kind of just had to go with the flow and deal with it as we could. And, and I dare say, if we hadn't had that kind of an experience uh, of the thought that Easter might be canceled, which of course you can't do, uh, we might have found ourselves in some serious trouble with, with huge problems um, trying to figure out what to do about those. But um, because it was Easter, um, in the middle of March, most of us got this news that the pandemic was going to cause some shutdowns and quarantines and various things, and we had to dig in and, and do something about it. And because of that, we were in kind of a, a mode of, of dealing with it. And because we did, interestingly enough, more people actually heard the gospel on Easter Sunday of 2020 than on any other day in the history of the world. Isn't that amazing? Uh, we were in crisis mode. Mo most of us didn't know what we were doing. Most of us didn't know how to do it. Most of us didn't know how, what, what even streaming online for worship looks like. But in four weeks, most of us who got online figured out how to get that little button on Facebook Live going or get a video on YouTube and make something happen. And as a result of not being in our buildings and being forced to go online, there was incredible attention given 
Um, we were fortunate to have um, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, all talking. What are churches going to do? And you can't cancel Easter, but they can't have them in person. What's their... And we had incredible attention given to the church and curiosity seekers and people who would never have come into church on even Easter morning somehow found their way to our online sites and more people heard the gospel on Easter 2020 than on any other day. Now, I wonder if the seventh Sunday of Pentecost, which was July 19th that year, um, had been the focus point, and uh, we've been in the middle of summer slump, would the results have been the same? Um, would people have said, my gosh, it's July 19th, and it's the seventh Sunday of Pentecost, we can't cancel church, or would the result been, well, it's summer slump, and we really don't know what we're doing, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But it's a good reminder of the urgency of a situation dictates the solutions we're open to. And because Easter felt urgent and the seventh Sunday of Pentecost feels like what we call it, ordinary time, um, I, I dare say that we did much better scrambling on the adrenaline rush of Easter. And as a result, the church catapulted itself in many ways forward into a, into a new place that it dared not think about going. Many people didn't wanna go but there was no other place to go. And we did it without a lot of controversy. Most of our members who would never have supported on uh, Ash Wednesday saying, you know, it's Ash Wednesday. I think we should cancel in-person services for Easter to see if we can get a bigger audience. We would all thought that was insane, but we did it. And lo and behold, in spite of the insanity it would have been under rational circumstances in the midst of a pandemic, it proved to be both possible and somewhat fruitful. So we had this change or die kind of mode, uh, which used to be the title of this conference. But I dare say Easter 2020 was not an inspired to thrive moment. It was change or die. We were motivated by disappearing, not by the wonderful opportunities that laid before it. And necessity creates these places where we have to make choices. Is it important to me or not? Does this matter enough to really scramble and be uncomfortable and learn new things? or is it no big deal? But when we feel we have no choice and we're responding to a crisis that we have to deal with, we, we find ourselves having options and moving forward. And now one of the things that's happened as a result of the pandemic since then, and now we've had a year and a half, is that many things have accelerated during COVID. Um, it's easy to blame COVID perhaps for a lot of the things we go through, but most trends show that in many ways, what happened was the next five or 10 years of trends all got compressed into six to 12 months. And so uh, church membership dropped faster, church participation dropped faster, and as exciting and as full as our online things were for Easter of 2020, now we have to decide, is this a sustainable thing and what happens? And today, um, worship services on the ground where they're happening are smaller. Online attendance doesn't mirror anything like what it did back a year and a half ago during the Easter season and that was a big brush of uh, making it happen. And now we're kind of dealing with the reality that, wow, the world has changed and it's changing fast even without COVID and now COVID's made it change even faster. And some of these are wonderful. We've learned how to use Zoom and we've changed conferences and we can interact with people. Um, I never would have met Carlos as a pastor in a situation like this, apart from the pandemic, to be honest, because the, the country was compressed into internet space, which has no, no mileage anymore. Um, but at the same time, we're all dealing with um, the tension and the anxiety and the excitement and all the things that go with, oh, wow, it's all different now. What are we going to do about it? So here's what we know. It appears that at the end of the COVID pandemic, which it may take longer to get to than we wanted, we're not there yet. It looks like general agreement, worship attendance is likely to be 70 to 80% of pre-COVID numbers in most places. There are places that won't approach that. And in many cases, the larger the ministry, the less percentage will, will return, it appears. So smaller congregations that had 40 are likely to get to 30 before congregations that had 4,000 are likely to get back to 3,000. Um, uh, Associated Press article this summer had done some data and showed about three quarters of our regular attenders pre-COVID attend, intend to be regular attenders when, when it's all done. And if you're back on the ground, you may be seeing some of these people um, participating regularly. 18% of people are still unsure. They, they haven't really gotten back in and they're not sure. And 7% have decided, you know, I've been out of church now for a few months. I'm really not missing it. I'm, I don't think I'm going back. And so we, we've got this move down where things are happening. Now, it's really important. And maybe if you only get one thing out of our talk today from me, 
I want you to look at that 18% who are unsure. Um, we don't know who they are exactly because they're in a mix of 25%. You don't know who's planned not to come and who's just not coming yet. But most of us, if we're in ministries where we can pay any attention to people as individuals right now, I wanna urge you to pay attention to people as individuals. If you're in a congregation that's uh, membership and uh, attendance numbers are, are sort of manageable, you can look at the directory and a name and put a face in that in your head already. Um, you should probably think about taking attendance every week. And I don't mean you have to pass a card or do anything, but do it mentally. Have a three or four people sit down with the directory and make a list and check off people and see who's there and who's not. Do it again next week. When you notice a pattern, any pattern that goes for a few weeks of somebody's not there, which we should have been doing this before COVID, call them, text them, give them personal attention. Because at the moment, if they're not there, they're in that 25% or whatever that percentage is in your place. They're in that group that's leaning out. You know they're not leaning in or they'd be leaning in by testing and coming. Look at your online attendance. Are they there? That's a different thing. Maybe you can find out um, from comments and prayer requests and things. But if somebody's not engaging, don't say, wow, our attendance is way down. Our engagement's way lower. It's on us as leaders to engage people, not wait for people to engage us. And I really want to urge you in this transition time, because you probably still have a lot of control over at least some of where this lands. And a lot of people will decide whether um, they land in or out based on whether it looks like anybody cares besides them, whether they're in or out. So real important time for contact, engagement, pastoral care, connections. So as we think about this, it's just really important to remember the pandemic didn't really break anything. It just took advantage of all the fragility that was already there and accelerated much of this. And if we can look at it that way and say, well, most of the things that went wrong with the church were actually going wrong slower, but now we got some quick information in a much shorter period of time. We can begin to think of this not just as the crisis and tragedy it is, of course, and not just for the church, but for society and for all the people who've been sick and died and lost people, but also for us as a time to rethink and reframe and begin to think about ministry and the work that we do in some new ways. We can't go back. You can't go back. 2019, as, as much as it feels like it might've been better than 2021, was not really the golden era of most of our ministries. So saying, well, if we just go back to do things the way we did in 2019, everything would be fine. Of course not. We all know that in 2019, a lot of things were happening in society-wide, church-wide, that the church needed to be making all sorts of changes. So to shoot for 2019 as kind of a new set point is a bad idea, even though a lot of our people are hungry just to get back to, quote, normal. But we have to rule it out. We can only go forward. And as leaders, if we can get people to lean into the future with this kind of space we have, we've created a bit of a blank um, canvas because so many things have not been happening that we have the opportunity to make some things happen. So if you're thinking about adapting in this and being an adaptive leader, one of the things I want to urge people to do is to really think through and, and, and leave those windows open longer. Um, I know anxiety makes people want to solve things really quickly. And usually a quick solution looks as much like the known past as possible because it doesn't take a lot of imagination to, to get there. And because people are already longing to get back together or go back to normal or all that kind of language you hear, which is a cue, um, it's pretty easy to move quickly to a spot where you really don't want to be. Uh, the flip side is most of us had to change how we did things or maybe put things on pause for a while. And the less you carry it over from February of 2020 to now, the more freedom you have with a year and a half of space to say, wow, you know what? We don't have to put it back anymore. It's been a year and a half and nobody's really whining and complaining about that. Maybe we shouldn't restart that. Or if we should restart it, maybe it's a chance to, to repeat repair it or improve it in some way. So that rather than putting it back the way it was, we do that function in some new way. So take this window to not try and get everything back in place and over program. I'm working with a congregation right now that I think is over programmed for this fall. And, and now they're feeling the stress of trying to put all their programs back in place and people aren't coming at the same pace. So they've got a lot of things that feel like they're flailing because they're putting them back for people and people aren't necessarily even saying we want them, but the leaders feel obligated to put the program, the entire menu back in place. So take the time to keep the window open and good leaders are gonna foster conversation. They're gonna speak 
speak to people, listen to people, put people in groups and let them talk. There'd be some musing, some listening. What if, or what do you miss about? What if we did that? Oh, that's interesting, but what about that? And just let people bounce things around and be willing to experiment and reflect and move into this new day. So if we're going forward rather than backward, what are we going to be about? What's the essence of this? And Carlos, you're going to begin to help us work on this question. Thanks, Dave. And I echo your comments. It's been a pleasure to, to work with you on this and to pull something together for this audience. And uh, how neat to be. This is my first ever virtual keynote, probably all of ours. Uh, but again, what a cool opportunity and really emblematic of what we're talking about here. How can we leverage the resource? that we're all familiar with to do more ministry, to share the gospel, to, to increase our platforms. Uh, for us, you know, the world changed on March 13th, 2020. And that, that's kind of a day that will live in infamy in my ministry because that was the day that the Miami-Dade public school system announced that they would be going virtual. Uh, I'll never forget the words. It was something like, uh, we will be moving to an online platform, and then what scared us all, indefinitely. And just like that, that was the, the bellwether, if you will, in our area. Now, literally within a week, restaurants, malls, parks were all closed. I'm sure you all experienced this in, in your area across the country. Almost every desk job went remote. Uh, we were all thrown into these crash courses on Microsoft Teams and Zoom. And, and like Dave was mentioning, figuring out how to do Facebook Live for those of us like myself who are social media dinosaurs. This was a whole new world. Uh, almost overnight, March 13th was a Friday. And I remember sitting with our team and saying, how are we going to do church on Sunday? Um, four days from or three days from now. And, and so while we all regret, you know, the circumstances, and, and we certainly would never wish a pandemic uh, on, on a country or on a world, uh, we do have it to thank for making us grow in ways, as Dave mentioned, that, that probably we would have never done, or at least could never even have imagined just weeks earlier. Uh, when I think about our ministry, we got a lot better at technology because we had to. Um, we were forced to think through almost everything we did. I'm going to say before COVID, I might have used the word protocol five times in my life. It was way down deep in the lexicon of my vocabulary. And yet, now we had a protocol for everything. Uh, and another thing that really changed in our group was uh, we got a lot better at communicating almost overnight. Suddenly there were emails going out to our families, our staff, our, our congregations, almost on a daily and weekly basis, telling them what we're doing next, what's coming. Uh, in essence, we really had to focus. And, and as, as Dave mentioned, had to think, rethink, if you want to say it that way, uh, the mission. Not what the mission is, but what had accumulated around the mission and, and what had to go and what had to stay. And, and you saw this happen in almost every aspect, right? I remember, uh, I think it was Stanford University, cut 11 Division I programs as soon as the pandemic hit. Why? Because these things were not critical to the mission. And they realized while we love equestrian, it's not something that we can and have to sustain. It was one of these things that compiled over time and the pandemic gave us all a chance to kind of reassess, clean out our basements, and, and what are we doing here? So we all put on our, our administrator hats. We led our groups through uh, the immediate crisis. And, and as I said earlier, this wasn't a bad thing. It focused us and, and made us grow in a lot of ways. And, and I also think that nothing brings a group together like a good crisis, right? And so suddenly we were all unified. We were all moving forward. Uh, but after just a few weeks of that, uh, things did start to feel a little bit different. Uh, it was almost as if our focus had changed somewhat uh, in our both our church and our academy ministry. Now we were sitting in meetings and 
spending so much time, just the conversation was dominated by talk of different platforms and bandwidths and, and what we were going to, how we were going to execute on said platform with said bandwidth. And, and they almost began to feel like IT meetings. And, and while I realized that was important, in my role, I, I started to get a little bit concerned that perhaps amid all the chaos, we were starting to lose focus of why we were doing what we were doing or, or what was at the heart of what we were doing. And it felt like the mission was taking a back seat to just all the to-do list, right? How do we do this? How do we do this? How do we do this? And so it was important for us to go back because for God's church and, and for God's people and, and finally for our Lord, the priorities hadn't changed. Um, as seen here on the screen, his desire, right, in, in 1 Timothy 2, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That hadn't changed. Or, or his command to us found in, in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations. Well, that was still in play. And so while it felt like everything had changed, and, and in many ways it had, God's will and his mission really had never wavered. And so I thought, while it felt somewhat like semantics, it was important for us to stay focused on that and to keep the mission central. Um, it really reminded us that you know, surviving COVID is not just about learning how to implement new technologies or learning how to rethink what we used to do. Surviving COVID is still, albeit in a very different way, about seeking and saving the lost for us, the church. There are social programs that, that are meant to take care of people. And obviously there's a whole group trying to make a vaccination and all these other things were going on. And yet for us, the church, it's important and still very important for us to remember that this whole thing is still about how can we seek and save the lost because God's command to us and his desire for all mankind have not changed. And that's really important to, to keep at the heart of what you're doing because I believe it keeps Christ centered in all of your decisions. Um, so if you, if you change the slide there, Dave, you, you start to see some questions. Um, and I think it was really important for us to do this because um, we were already, you know, a, a pan, post pandemic church 18 months ago. And, and I think that that was lost on some people. Uh, one of the biggest things that struck me when COVID hit was that there was this mindset that the world used to be safe and now it's really scary. And, and the truth is, this has been going on throughout history, right? Pre-COVID, you had cancer and heart attacks and, and the most dangerous thing we're all going to do is get in our car and drive home this afternoon. And yet there was now this sense that everything had changed, that, that the world was a different place. And yet for us, the church, you know, I would imagine God is in heaven saying, this is not my first rodeo. Um, how can God use this pandemic to spread his work and his word? Those are questions that we had to ask ourselves as we began to focus on this. Um, how is God using us, you know, our church, our school, um, across our campuses? How is he using us during this time, this place, this circumstance? Uh, and how would he want to use us? You know, would it be just about finding the snazziest way to, to get something online and streaming to have the best audio? Or would it still be about reaching, seeking, and saving the loss? And when you do this, and when you start to talk this way, it really takes the focus off of us. And that's what we found. It was no longer about what do we feel like do, right? Or what are we comfortable with? Um, what do our people feel like tuning into? And now our focus got back on the mission and, and who we're here to serve in our community. Um, like I said earlier, th this isn't God's first rodeo. And if you look throughout history, God has blessed the church through many pandemics. Uh, the church has survived uh, some of the craziest people in history, right? Some of the worst famines. You think about the church surviving societies that were so bad that God literally wiped them off the face of the earth with fire and brimstone. Um, if you go all the way out to the extreme, the church has survived the humiliating crucifixion or execution of its central figure, our Savior, Jesus. Uh, the point being, 
God will get us through this and God will use this to continue his will here on this earth. Um, we've all heard it said, right? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And, and you think about that, you wonder yourself, how many of the New Testament apostles, right? These men who have their names on churches and, and schools across the country and across the globe, how many of them would have been so missionary minded were it not for the persecution they were facing, right? Or the apostle Paul, God bless him, um, he was so often literally running for his life as he went to the next town to seek and save the lost. And uh, I was just reading earlier about the Antonine Plague. And this was in 165 AD. They think it was something like smallpox in today's medical dictionary. Uh, and they credit this with giving the Christian church a foothold in Rome and, and throughout Europe. Right? Because what happened? The Romans fled. They said, we're out of here. We don't want to get this thing. And the Christians stayed behind to take care and to love those who were sick. Fast forward 150 years later, you've got the Vatican and the Christian church central in that area. Uh, and many credit something like that terrible Antonine plague for the growth and the spread of the church. Now, this is unforeseen. I'm having a fire drill right now in the hotel that I'm in. So I don't know if we just want to take a two-second pause, or I can hand it off to you, Dave, and mute. Why don't I take it from here for a little bit, and then if the thing goes off, you can jump back in. Um, I think what Carlos is talking about is just making sure we keep things in perspective and, and to think about the kind of work we're doing. Um, and the calling we have, and to believe that regardless of the circumstances that we're involved in, that we're all still called to engage and, and to give God our best. And so that's really a question we want to ask is, uh, how is it that you're giving the Holy Spirit the best material you have to bless? In fact, the really the evangelical task of the church is to, to lift up the word and to do it well, to engage people and to bear witness well, to love and to care for people and to do it well, and to believe that our work doesn't necessarily produce the fruit. We know that that's the work of the spirit. For the best things, the spirit to have to work with. And so if we've established the sense that the, that the mission hasn't changed and that this um, is an opportunity, um, the, the big question we really want to ask is to think about in your own mind, is the opportunity before you want to see as opportunity? Um, there's been a lot of struggle, a lot of change, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. Uh, but at the same time, we know that God is still God and God is still working. And there's something that in the midst of the things we, we don't like, the things we want to even um, cry out and lament over, that still opportunity is there because God is still God and God works in both the good and the bad to produce that which is good. So we know that there are a lot of congregations all across the country. And we know that the effect of this pandemic um, makes the platforms bigger for all these things. And we could be talking about meeting millions and millions of people we've never met before. And an opportunity that's before us to really rethink um, all sorts of connections and all sorts of people who had never darkened our doors before. Uh, we're in the process of working on live streaming in my church and I've got a young 19 year old guy who is pretty disconnected from church life uh, since he finished catechism. Uh, we're doing this and all of a sudden he's the one person in our entire system who literally knows in a really, really efficient and effective way. And he's now re-engaged and participating in something that he felt and disconnected from. So there's some incredible opportunities before. And so since the church was already kind of moving in the wrong direction in terms of connection with uh, attendance figures and all those things that were on decline, it's really a chance for us to embrace some of this and begin to think about how to move forward. So the question is, uh, what's going to be at the heart of the future church for us? And how's that going to look? And remember that the future church is going to be hybrid, which doesn't mean it's online and not on the ground, nor that it's online or on the ground, rather, and not paying attention to on, online kind of opportunities. It's going to have a digital presence and it's going to have a, a physical presence. And both are going to be important. And effective leaders are going to be thinking about this. 
how big should our digital presence be? How much en uh, energy should go into our physical presence? How do we balance? How do we connect? How do we interact? Always thinking about how this reaches people and furthers the work that we do. So a lot of this is going to be about wisdom. Um, I can do this. Should I do this? I could do that. Should I do that? Should I do both? Should I do neither? And, and the wisdom of being able to see and understand these things is going to grow with time as we become more and more um, clear where people are landing. And at the same time, more and more able to uh, understand what each platform and uh, environment can produce in ways that allow people to connect for ministry to happen for mission to take place and for us to move forward so i'm going to talk for a, a minute here about worship and we all started with worship at least in most cases because we were forced by this easter adrenaline rush to say we got to have worship we got to get it online and, and there's a lot of different ways to do that now the way we started worship in the congregation house is we turned the laptop around on a tv tray and we pushed the facebook live button and we saw what happened and uh, that was week one, and then we learned from it, and we've been doing that. But eventually, we started to record, edit, and post. In fact, I was finishing uh, putting the recording pieces for our worship service online this morning together. I'm uploading them to the internet for a guy who's going to do some editing work and bring that back as a finished piece. Um, that produces a really high-quality worship experience because you can edit out mistakes. You can get everything smooth. You can put captions and all kinds of things together. Um, but it takes a lot of time. Or you can just turn the camera on with nobody in the sanctuary without people present, just the leaders, and do the service um, leadership on camera and just go live through it. It takes a lot less time because you don't have to edit and put all the segments together. But if you make a mistake, it's live and you get what you get. You can also live stream with people present, which is what um, a lot of congregations are moving to. They have their on the ground service. People are back in the chairs and pews. Worship happens and then there's a camera or more. Uh, producing this, and you're just basically televising in some sense, one way or the other, the service that you have on the ground so that it's also online. Uh, there's communal live stream, which works really well um, in different ways to create interactions. And uh, maybe for smaller congregations, a good way to have done Sundays during the pandemic, maybe even for larger ones, might be the way Lenten services turn out to be long-term, that we can gather people who weren't coming on Wednesdays anymore because of time and crunch and all the rest, um, at seven o'clock, they can go on a Zoom platform and do an interactive worship, and they might find that um, that's engaging for them and meaningful and worth the effort um, to do a Wednesday thing. Um, many congregations found their midweek service attendance went up during the pandemic, even if their Sunday attendance went down. You don't have to do video at all. I think that's really important. Audio only is okay. In fact, I know of one large congregation that did a really high quality edited worship service during the pandemic and then eventually said you know now that we're back on the ground and we're doing this it's just too much work let's go back to podcasting only audio and and be honest it's it's a choice not to be there you can say we don't have to be online we needed to be perhaps during the pandemic because we couldn't um, be in person physically but maybe now because of this changing piece and the dynamics in the community where you live work and serve and the people that you're trying to reach connect with maybe online isn't an effective stewardship of your time and energy or accessible due to technology to do a good job and you can just say you know that was what we did to get through the pandemic now it's over we're going to stop we don't have to do the same thing over and over so i'm going to tell you this story about the congregation where i serve when the pandemic hit um, on march 15th we had noticed in illinois that we were likely to have to shut down on march 17th um, Unfortunately, from a timing perspective, my wife and I, my wife is a minister here also, she's a deacon in ELCA, had been on a sabbatical that ended, March 15th was my first Sunday back from a sabbatical and our last Sunday before the pandemic. So it was a huge disconnect, connect, change. So knowing that, I stuck the laptop in the aisle with a TV tray underneath it and we pushed Facebook Live and we just did it and we just wanted to see what would come out. We went back and watched the recording. A couple of people actually found it on, online as it went. And we saw, well, it was better than we thought and worse than it needed to be. Um, we could hear tolerably well. We began to move the environment around. We bought microphones. We bought you know, a new camera. We dealt with a small soundboard to get sound issues together. We did all kinds of things and got the quality of our live stream pretty good uh, within two or three weeks. So by Easter, uh, we had put together something that was very tolerable and we felt good, but it was live streamed. 
We had problems though. We were using a Wi-Fi, and even though we had a pretty good Wi-Fi system, sometimes it would just kind of, you know, how it just straggles along, um, and it would just stop. And uh, people online would lose the signal because we weren't putting it out anymore, or the camera would freeze up, and we'd have to reboot it. Five minutes. We began to think, you know, if this is going to last longer, we've got to do it differently. And when it became clear that when Memorial Day of 2020 came and we weren't going to go back to worship, which was our original thought, right? Six to ten weeks, and we'll be back in there. We had to think about it over. So we switched to recording and editing everything ahead. We record uh, 16 to 19 segments every week, uh, announcements, prelude, prayer of the day, reading sermons, children's sermon, all that stuff. We put them together, edit, caption, and put up it's a lot of work, um, but very high quality because if we screw up, we do it again. So there's very few mistakes and people have really, really liked it. Um, in terms of response and things, I think we did for a congregation our size, about 100 a week on attendance. Uh, we did as well as anybody technically. And we began to work on quality and efficiency and got better at it. Eventually, we put some money into paying somebody else to edit, so I don't have to do that anymore. And it became a pretty good um, way of functioning. But it was pandemic. We didn't have any physical on the ground worship yet. Then we started to come back. And when we came back on the ground, all of a sudden, we had a... a all this editing work and production work to do. And suddenly we had to prepare for Sunday services and interact with people physically and put on a physical service at 8.30 and at 10.45 with COVID protocols going on. And it was just insane. And all of a sudden we'd been working pretty much full tilt to get the online and suddenly had to work full tilt to do online and on the ground. We just didn't have time. We did not have the staff. We didn't have the money. We didn't have the energy. And we thought, man, this is just crazy because now we're actually in hybrid for the very first time. We'd only been online until we started to come back. Now we got to function with both. We began to rethink this and who was there looking at our numbers, who had come back and what we were doing this for. We put together a tech team and now we've got PTZ, their um, cameras that are kind of robotic and you can control. And we're getting ready to transition to live streaming in November this year. We're going to stop editing and producing and we're going to live stream um, our actual physical service and have a, a sound and um, camera crew that will function and edit and hopefully produce a pretty high quality worship experience. I share this because I really want you all to hear the decisions you made don't dictate the decisions you should now make. And because you did it and it went well, doesn't mean you need to continue it as the environment changes. And it might be that you did something and some people would say, oh, we probably shouldn't have done that then. No, you might have made the right decision for August of 2020. But now that it's October of 2021, a lot has changed and people are coming back. We're in a different environment than we were even a year ago. The things that you thought were excellent decisions and may have worked really well may not be something you want to sustain and go forth. So really, I want to give you all the freedom. Let me go back to this slide here to say, you know, we can do any of these. We can live stream with or without people. We could record and do it ahead. We could use Zoom platforms. We could stop doing video altogether and just do audio and a podcast. We could just leave the online worship piece apart because there's only so much we can mess with. All of us have to make decisions. And I really want to emphasize podcasting, especially for small congregations. And I know of a large congregation uh, with a couple thousand people a week before COVID that produced excellent recorded worship during the pandemic. And as they've come back now, they've stopped all video work, even though they're a huge congregation by the standards of most of us, a couple thousand people a week, big staff, and they only do podcasting again. Podcasting is inexpensive. Most anybody with their PA system and a sound work can find a way to get the sound out into an iPad. You've got apps that are easy. The files are small and people can um, load them and podcasts are very popular to, to listen to. My wife listens to them all the time. You can hear them in the car. They can be on the train. It's very accessible. So don't assume that you need to do the most you can do. Think about what's effective. And in some cases, many of us should probably stop broadcasting video streams and begin to rethink some of this because there's so much more than Sunday morning. Look at the data about your own worship service. How many are coming? How many were coming? What direction is it going? Who is it that there? Is it mostly shut-ins and snowbirds and people who are checking in on vacation? Or have you reached a new audience of people that are um, online only and actually beginning to engage in a different way? These kind of things will help you decide what you're doing and what's effective and also what you're doing and what you should perhaps consider doing in order to either change that audience 
or if that's the audience you have to figure out what you need to serve them. So begin to look at your data and who's watching and how long they're watching and begin to think about it, would it be better instead of producing the whole worship service, if our attendance drops off after the sermon, maybe we should just do a podcast at the sermon. These are the kind of things I think will free you up in a hybrid environment to do the kinds of work that you need to do, knowing that at the end of the process, the goal is to do the best stewardship of the people you have, their gifts, talents, your staff, and lay people alike and free them to do the ministry that they need to do in the most effective ways, digitally and physically on the ground, to reach people and to do mission in, in the church. The other thing is the online world has made the church um, ministry world so much bigger. It might be, depending on where you live, that maybe two or three of your congregations should be online, but do it together. Share the load, share the expense, share the preaching rotations and all kinds of things. And then editing and recording as a group would be a great option. Say, so this is produced by the congregations of your town or your um, school district or your county or whatever. And education is one of the great doorways. Um, we've focused so much on worship, worship, worship. But um, Zoom classes, imagine if you're in a small congregation and you're um, the one pastor or deacon, lay leader who offers a class and you have a weekday Bible study and you may be using the lectionary text as your base. That's a very common format. Probably the number one format of Bible study in the Lutheran church is lectionary Bible study during the week. And all of a sudden you're cooperating with three other congregations, all who have one Bible study a week as well. And the people actually buy into it, the pastors and deacons and leaders buy into it. And so instead of one class for the congregation, each congregation provides one class. And suddenly you've got four teachers and four classes. You could do something two evenings and two different mornings. One of the classes could be lectionary Bible study. Another could be spiritual practices. One could be theology and current events. You can begin to create a faculty and a curriculum so that small congregations that have really been cheated in a sense of the ability to learn and have access to a number of things the way maybe a larger congregation does, suddenly have the same access to educational and discipleship opportunities as larger congregations. I think this is one of the most exciting things to think about. If we could move discipleship and education online cooperatively, many of our small congregations with 30 or 40 people would suddenly be messing with four different staff people and pulling from a pool of 150 to 200 people, and they could think bigger online than they could ever think physically. So hybrid worship doesn't just mean on our hybrid church doesn't just mean online worship it means so much more and that's where i'm going to give it back to, to carlos now hopefully his fire drill is over and he's still there and uh, we'll dig back in at this last section to begin to think about some of these other things yes full disclosure i'm in a hotel in austin texas and uh, i saw a sign on my door as i came into the room fire drill today they did not tell me it would be ha happening during the inspired to thrive conference but it was just a drill we're here um, I had some other things to say, but I'm just going to jump around and uh, I agree, think beyond Sunday and uh, maybe start with, uh, we talked about a spirit of permission and forgive me if I'm repetitive, I had about seven minutes there where I didn't hear anything. Um, there's, a, there's a time and a place to, to think through, through, through things and I think the pandemic has really created this open environment for those of us who live in these conservative Christian Christian churches, you know, you know how difficult that could be sometimes to achieve. And so we have this, this, this opportunity in this window. So as it says, allow yourself to dream, right? And, and again, this isn't unprecedented, right? This has been happening throughout our lives. I'm, I'm 43 years old. 43 years ago, church looked a lot different. Right? I remember when we first used an overhead projection during a sermon. Remember those old uh, overheads that you could write on and, and put them up against the wall? And that was a big deal. Like, whoa, now we're, we're, techn we're using technology. And then the hymnal changed, at least in the, within the Wisconsin Senate. And then the next hymnal came. And then some uh, contemporary worship started to get a foothold. And, and you could suddenly sing a same song that you heard on the radio. And that was a little bit surprising. Uh, and then now you go into almost any church and you'll see two flat screen TVs up at the front, right? So this idea of embracing technology or just worship changing over time, it's nothing new. Uh, as Dave pointed out, this has accelerated everything tremendously. But the truth is we've always been doing this and we should always be doing this. And now we're just forced to maybe do it 
a little differently than maybe we had anticipated. So, so how do we think beyond uh, Sunday? Uh, we spent so much time talking about worship, but, but let's just look at other aspects of our ministry, because I do think at this point we have to accept moving forward that everything we've done, every platform we've mastered, every new format we've presented to our people, it's going to get applied to, to almost every aspect of our ministries. And I'll be the first to admit that as we transition back to normal, I found myself asking, could this have been Zoomed? Right? That's a question that's now asked. Could we have Zoomed this? Somehow that word, a, a platform that we never knew about has become a verb, right? Could this be Zoomed? And that question's happening uh, across, across almost every industry and to include ministry. And, and if I just look at our group, right? Um, we have five campuses or six campuses now and, and Texas and Florida, we've got over 220 people or employees that, that make up the Divine Savior team. Um, and for ever, up until 18 months ago, it was just assumed that every morning we'd all be reporting to an office near you. But the rules have changed. Now we have people asking us, uh, can I do this remotely? Can we have flex hours? Um, do I need to come in every day? Can I just work four tens? It's like everything has changed in 18 months. And I don't think it's because we have this toxic work environment as a, a as a matter of fact, I've been told the contrary. It's just people now see the world differently. And all of this technology has created a myriad of opportunities uh, and a myriad of, of imaginations, if you will, of, wow, I could do my job this way or this way or this way. And that's going to get applied uh, to every aspect of what we do. Um, as we talked about earlier, this conference used to be called Change or Die. It's now called Inspired to Thrive. But as it pertains to this issue, I think the, the, the former name was more fitting because I fear that if we don't change in this regard and if we don't accept the fact that people are seeing the world differently, uh, we're going to get left behind because there is a group out there that will. And, and this pandemic has really given us all right? An extended time out uh, from our dominated lives with schedules. And, and people had a chance to catch your breath and, and to reevaluate, right? How they want to spend their time, what they think is valuable, uh, what is possible. And, and what I'm not hearing among all the things is driving 20 minutes each way to sit in a meeting, right? So things have changed. And, and I think we have to start asking ourselves these questions. Um, how can we, or how can your church, right, embrace worship beyond, or, or hybrid ministry beyond Sunday morning? Um, there is still value in getting together, and, and I don't think that should go by the wayside. I'm not promoting that. There are things like fellowship and conversations before and after the meeting, or just those private one-offs that you might have with someone as, as you talk about something they'd like you to pray for. Those things happen best and, and probably only in person. And we always say, you know, ministry happens best in the context of a relationship. So I think as leaders, we have to be very conscious of, of still finding ways to create relationships, right? And to get people involved and together. But we should be asking questions, as Dave mentioned, about you know, what about evening meetings, right? School board meetings, church council meetings, elders meetings, all the, these meetings that, that used to happen at night and so often are dictated by someone who has to walk 30 seconds across a parking lot in order to get to the office. Can we start to ask ourselves, can this happen virtually? Because I guarantee you, your people are going to be asking that question. Can catechism classes be done online? Uh, midweek Bible studies, connect groups. Uh, they mentioned Lenten and Advent service. Um, we're not going to get into to all the aspects of this, but, but you and your group can make your own list as you look through what you're doing and ask yourself, you know, how, how is it realistic? Um, how can we maintain a sense of fellowship? How can we keep people together? But also, how can we best meet the needs of our people in this new reality. Um, again, if you think about who your people are, right? How many of your families between work, appointments, club sports, 
uh, some semblance of their social life, how many of their schedules are just chock full? Uh, I have a four, six and 12 year old and I'm just starting to feel that, right? Maddox is in soccer, Kingston's in football and cross country, Hadley's in volleyball, the play and choir. And suddenly you go here, I'll go there. I'll meet you in the middle. That's become our life, right? To an extent. And that's the same thing so many of our people are experiencing. Um, and while I wouldn't say that this has to be a, an either or, right? Everything goes virtual, everything goes in person. It is definitely something uh, that we should consider. Another question we can ask ourselves is, is how many people you know, can we engage in addition to this, right? This doesn't have to be who are we affecting negatively, but who are we affecting positively? Go ahead, Dave, if you flip the screen, it says, when it comes to meetings, I challenge you or your group to, to think through these questions, right? Is there a need to be physically in the same space? Now, your answer might be yes, because we don't believe we can connect any other way. Okay, but at least ask the question, you know, being a hybrid, does it have to be every time? I was just talking with our, our church leaders here in Austin, and they said, we were virtual for about a year. Everybody got together and said, we need to get back together in person. We had one meeting in person, and at that meeting, we decided, let's keep it virtual. <laughs> so now they're staying hybrid uh, and, and online. Uh, who, why, why are we, or what is gained if we pick one format over another? Um, who does this exclude, or to put it positively, right? Who does this engage, right? If you're uh, one, of if you're a person, I'm just getting out of this phase where you have a two and a four year old. You know that bedtime is a sacred thing in your house, and very few things are going to disturb that. Well, is there a way that we can mold these models or or work around that, right? Can there be a connect group at eight o'clock? That's after bedtime, but I can't leave the house, but I would love to engage and connect with people. And so how can we get more people involved and, and through the use of these technologies? Um, it's my opinion that, that if you do this, you're going to gain more engagement, that you're going to have more people involved, uh, that you're going to have a larger pool of people to pull from. And if, if most of our organizations volunteers are the backbone of what we get done right and so this embracing this format is only going to in my opinion provide more people increase your pool and increase engagement again this isn't a, an absolute thing there, there's a format that fits everybody you might have an elderly group that likes to get together for breakfast at 6 30 in the morning god bless it but you also might have a group of moms that would love to get together after bedtime and they can only do that virtually. So again, this pandemic has created a spirit of permission and openness and an opportunity to talk about this. Um, talk about Bible studies, right? Connect groups. Um, how does this increase or decrease participation? You know, it doesn't have to be an either or, but how can you get more people involved? Uh, does the minister, does the medium add or, or subtract from their experience, right? Is one option more efficient than the other? In what format can you best accomplish your goals? Uh, and, and how many people are you going to reach? As, as Dave had that, uh, there's no going back, right? Those two slides. And that really is true. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there that, that are thinking, I just can't wait for this all to be over so that we can go back to normal. Uh, but I really don't think that that's a, a winning position. Um, and I don't think most of your people are going to agree with that. So this is a both and thing. And we just have to accept that. And furthermore, I would say embrace it. Um, I, I was, you know, that got cut off by the fire drill, but I, I wanted to point out earlier, this can be something we lament or resent, or we as leaders can frame this as an opportunity. Again, going back to what we were talking about in history, the ancient Christian church, how God used that, right, to spread his gospel. Um, we'll set the tone on this, and, and people are going to follow as we, the leaders, you know, set that tone. And so 
I would just encourage everyone on this call or on this in this Zoom to really talk about this in terms of opportunity, in terms of a new chance or a new way. And, and when you think about the compounding effect that could have, right, not just on this country, but in the world, um, I was looking at the Hartford Institute and they said there's some 314,000 Protestant or Christian churches. I mean, it's a big number, 314,000 just in this country. And then you add on to that the 10,000 plus schools. Now imagine if just each of those groups could, could do the things, some of the ideas that Dave and I have expressed to just increase that platform just a little. Right? You just have all these little bubbles across the country getting just a little bit reaching just a few more people, engaging just a few more leaders, allowing it to be possible for just a few more moms to get to an evening connect group. You'd be talking about millions and millions of people being reconnected to the church, to Christ, uh, to their savior. This is an opportunity. And as we talked about earlier, giving the Holy Spirit the best product to bless giving him the, uh, the mediums, if you will, to do. He doesn't need us, obviously. But our job on this earth is to give him the best opportunity to change hearts and lives. And I believe there's a chance to do that right now. I'm going to just end with, uh, with an anecdote uh, of a group that has gone all in, if you will, uh, on embracing technology. And this is a, a mission group that really tried to flip the mission model. Right? So typically, you would send an expat to a remote village somewhere, and he would reach the 100 to 150 people that he could reach. Well, we've since kind of flipped the model on its head and said, what if we put four of those expats, but we kept them here in the States? We gave them all the infrastructure that a first world country provides. And rather than try and meet with people physically, we do that virtually. And so they found it in 2016. They spent about four years and, and some money building a platform. It's called Academia Cristo. And this platform has uh, devotions and Bible studies, sermons, podcasts, uh, all kinds of materials uh, for you to grow in grace. Well, they launched in 2020. And, and as of right now, they have about 1.4 million followers online. So they've created this huge funnel of people, over 4 million online engagements every month. And then that funnel is meant to work down into house churches. And the theory being, if we can make the funnel big enough at the top, you'll get people who are engaged at a very, a very uh, surface level. But then you'll have people who wanna take a Bible study and the next Bible study and the next Bible study. And they created this whole thing called a, a Camino or the way. And, and that is meant to create and train leaders. Again, all this done virtually. And as people progress through, they, they, they can meet like we are on Zoom with pastors. Well, here we are today, a little over a year later, and you have dozens of house churches across South, South Central and the Caribbean. Now, this is run by eight employees uh, full time and 50 volunteers between the United States and Latin America. So this takes a group and it takes a commitment. But this is an example of how God can use something that was on no one's radar, certainly 10 years ago even five years ago, and then for the average congregation, not even two years ago, and can do incredible things. And so, again, opportunity. Um, Dave mentioned the one thing he wanted you to remember. I would say the one thing I want you to take from this is that frame everything that's happened over the last 18 months as an opportunity to grow, to, to meet God's people where they're at, and to uh, seek and save the lost. I'm going to stop there, Dave. I know we've got time for Q&A, uh, but you can take it back. Yeah, thanks, Carlos. Uh, just as you, as you do this, uh, what a great reminder, Carlos, that we can engage and we can be creative and that this is an opportunity. Uh, it does take time and energy. It does take work. You have to do something, but we probably are in a moment that's never been more significant for the church in our lifetime, at least, to see real paradigm shifts and new ways of working. And that's exciting. And I want to finish with this simple um, reminder. Um, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, uh, Paul said this, I am confident of this, 
that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. And when Paul wrote it to the Philippians, that was true, and it was designed to encourage and remind them that God is working through all things and will fulfill all that God has promised in Christ. And that statement is as true today as God says this to you. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. And we pray that um, as you engage this, that you not only find that and know that to be true, but that you see that happening and find ways to make it um, fulfilled in your own ministry. I'm going to stop sharing. And um, I know, um, Charlotte, you've maybe been monitoring the Q&A chat section and may have a few things uh, that people want to comment or ask, and I'll give it back to you. Yes, sounds great. Thank you both for the very inspiring messages. Uh, we have a few questions and we have a few minutes, so I'm just going to throw them out there. Uh, the first question is, can video be easily transformed into podcast? Oh, yes, it's easy to pull. It's very easy. If you've done video, you can strip the audio off it um, quite easily with an app, um, run it through GarageBand. Um, uh, yes, not a problem. I won't get into long answers, but yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And then the next question is, how do you measure and evaluate what is best online, in person, or both? Well, I, I would just say that um, part of that is personal preference, right? I think you have to consider your audience. So is this an inward focused uh, issue or an outward focused issue? So something like a building committee meeting, well, that's an inward focused issue. And so you can say, well, what do we want to do, right? But if you're talking about online worship, then it's an outward focused thing. And you would say, what best serves our community? Who is our community, right? What are their needs? Who can we engage? And so I really think it's the, the question is best answered by understanding who your audience is. Um, and then even within something like a, a building committee, I would encourage you to think beyond the eight people on that committee. You know, could John or, or Susie or Paul be on this committee if we considered a different format, right? And, and I would be hesitant to say anything should be all one or the other. But I do think that, you know, it's, it's certainly worth the conversation. Anything to add to that, Dave? What I would say is that um, you don't have to do the same thing every time. For example, the property committee might say, we should meet in the building. We need to walk the building, look together, make some decisions about, see, observe things. At the same time, there might be an issue comes up. The property committee has to make a decision on the, the boiler broke. Do we need to have all of us go to the building to see that the boiler broke, or can we just trust that the person who said the boiler broke, broke, and we meet online to say we should call a repair company, but somebody has to authorize that. So the same group might do something one month one way or a different time another. Councils and boards might say we're going to meet quarterly in person and the other two times on Zoom, have a rotation. Uh, it doesn't have to even be one answer for the same people every time. People just need to ask the question, what's best this time and why? And if they've got an answer, then that'll probably be the right answer if they've really thought and prayed it through. Great, thank you. So another question says that when building a new ministry, would you agree that a good question is, can I do this on my phone? We have said, if it isn't cheap, uh, smartphone compatible, then it isn't worth it. What do you think? Uh, I disagree, but only slightly. <laughs> Um, I think that, that there's some great insight in that and that particularly for a lot of things um, has to deal with phone, but I would say, hey, that's only the online question and a lot of online things won't fulfill everything. There's still going to need to be on the ground things that might be phone compatible. For example, you might be able to take an offering in worship and the phone might be the vehicle for that, but worship still may not be happening on the phone at that point or even interacting with the phone. Um, I would say, though, that one thing that I heard in a workshop I took over a year ago now, and I was a participant in, the person made the case, if you're doing something, you should try to figure out how it works on a screen. And it might not be a phone. Phones are pretty small, but a screen. It might be a tablet, might be a projection. And his argument was, is if you take a sermon, say, in worship, and then you have worship physically in the place, but you're streaming your worship, then you should be able to strip the sermon out of that and make its own thing out of it and maybe produce some uh, house church liturgy. And on Tuesday, a group of people in the same ministry 
um, in a multiplying way, might take Sunday's sermon, but listen to it on Tuesday night in a house church environment with a liturgy, and that the ability to move things from screen to screen, not just phone at this point, but maybe even back to larger screens for groups, which um, is there, that screen ministry allows something to be used multiple times in multiple audiences from small groups to house churches to large group settings. And I do think we should be really thinking, I thought he was right, screen compatibility is multiplication of resources. And even in a large auditorium, most people report that if they're in a large auditorium and they're listening to the speaker and the speaker's also on the screen, they're watching the speaker on the screen and that even though he or she is standing in the room with them, they tend not to watch the person. They're much smaller than the projection. So even in a room, electronics sometimes dominates and that's okay. Carlos, you want anything? I would just remove the qualifier cheap. <laughs> I don't know that it has to be cheap. <laughs> I do think smartphone compatible is, is, is important. Uh, there is more and more showing that uh, most engagement happens on on one of these. Um, my wife orders everything off of Amazon here, right? And and so that is the way things are moving. And I definitely think it's something to consider. Um, but I don't know that it has to be cheap too. Great, thank you. Another question comes from someone who lives in Chicago. He says, "My church started doing small groups online. It increased engagement." But when, but when we did recorded Bible studies to watch on demand, hardly anyone watched them. Do you have any ideas why this might be? And do you have ideas of content churches have created for their audience that are on high demand and that get high engagement? I would, I would, I'll just start by saying, go ahead. I'll just start by saying, I think the idea of a Bible study, most people want to be interactive. And so to watch something pre-recorded or, you know, asynchronous, as they say, um, I think that's probably at the heart of that as much as anything. People come to a Bible study to engage. Go yeah, ahead. I agree. Yeah, the relationship and the engagement is really the key. People aren't looking for information. They're looking for to grow in a space with connection. And so synchronous viewing versus asynchronous viewing changes everything about that. And so I agree with Carlos that they probably don't care about the information alone. They care about being in community where that information stands at the center of the community's identity. And it's just a whole different thing. It's also a lot less work, frankly, to put together a live online Bible study with people interacting than it is to produce recorded content. So it may not be good stewardship. If people aren't watching it, just give up. The best engagement that most people find is a good Facebook post and the sermon. If you could take your sermon and engage that and pull that out of your worship, whether it's uh, audio, but especially if you've got video, and then create a post and get your people in um, who are Facebook actives to begin to interact with that and share it. Um, you can create one directional content in sermons with good Facebook or social media interaction to create engagement. That's probably if you're going to produce anything the easiest because you're already preaching and the most engaging because you're trying to get it within a social ministry format where people are used to commenting and responding. So that's just my suggestion of the most prevalent format that actually does work for quote recorded things ahead. Great, I think we have time for one more question uh, and we'll take this one. How do you engage people online while streaming live worship? We, we have a dedicated person to that. Um, I don't think you can ask your pastor at the front or your organist or, or whoever your praise band to be doing that. We, within our, our teams that help us get through a Sunday morning worship, right? You have your ushers and your acolyte and your praise band. And we've added to that now our online engagement person. And so we have someone who's there uh, talking to people, encouraging them, answering questions, uh, helping people log in, uh, just dedicated to that. And that's how they serve that Sunday morning. I would say, though, in addition to that, and I think that that's really a key, is you need a host, a greeter, a concierge of, of, who's dealing with that online kind of environment. The pastor, um, preacher in particular, can really up engagement with how he or she preaches and engages. One of the most engaging Facebook Live things we did, um, the text that week was back in the Easter season and dealt with something with the word and I decided to talk about scripture and grounding of the word. 
And so I just asked people, um, you're, you're, you're with us online today, and um, I've just brought, I brought a huge stack of Bibles, different trans, NIV, the message, NRSV, put it on a big table. Some were study Bibles, some were not, and I had it there while I preached. And I said, I've got all these different, which one do you read at home and find that you actually read it because you make, it, you make sense of it? And people started commenting, I read the message or the English Standard Version or the contempt or all these kinds of things. And I got a lot of comments because as a pastor, I asked people a question and asked them to engage. Then I said, if you use a study Bible, uh, which of the study Bibles you, you found most helpful when people said, like the NIV study Bible or Harper Collins or, you know, whatever those were. And I got a lot of things. So pastors, preachers in general have the ability to, to spur this on. And if you know, people are there to, to talk to them and say, um, what do you think? Put it in the comment section. And what happens is we got a lot of people who commented who had never commented before. And until somebody comments on Facebook Live, you can see how many people are there, but you don't know who they are. And once they come out of the shadows, because you asked a good question or engaged in a good way, now you can follow up and say, wow, there's somebody I've never seen before. You can send them a message, link back up, reply, and now you can begin to build a relationship. So I think it's both having a host, but I do think the liturgy leaders and preachers can make a huge difference if they actually talk to people, not just in the room, but actually talk and ask questions for response. Charlotte, I know, I know we're out of time. I see Daryl's question. Is the future of worship a combination of live and face-to-face? -face? And then he says, bottom line. And I would just say the future of ministry, right? I wouldn't pigeonhole it just to worship. I would say the future of ministry is a combination of live and face-to-face. -face. And that bleeds into every aspect, but it's not as black and white as this you do online and this you do in person. But we do have to rid ourselves of our of our desire to say, I just want to get back to normal. And we yep. need to embrace this new opportunity to find ways to engage and bring these formats that we all have become accustomed to into how we do ministry, period. Yeah, and we won't all find the same answer at the same time because you're not all doing with the same people in the same context. So give yourself yes. some free to learn from each other and um, enjoy the journey. God's going to be working through it. Absolutely. And thank you so very much for taking that last question. That was awesome. Thank you so much to both of you. This has been so incredible. And we just thank you so much for sharing your insights. And, and we uh, pray that God continues to bless you on your journey. So thank you. And thank you to everybody for attending this session. And check out the other sessions today and tomorrow. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.